You wondering what this mic is for? So am I, because I got this mic on. This is for just in case. Anybody has anything you want to add to? So I made some handouts. My handouts are a little bit different than Pastor Joshua uses um, because, huh? I took them because there was still a whole stack. Oh, I gave you the entire stack. Yeah, you'd pass them out. Okay, so my handouts, they're a little, they're, they're interactive. You have to fill them out. You don't have to, but it's, uh, yeah, it's mandatory. You have to turn them in at the end of the class with your name and Connie will grade them. <laughs> yes, red pen, nothing on them. You get, you get an F if you don't put your name on it. Now, these are just for fun. Um, you know, everybody, everybody learns differently. Uh, everybody has a different style. Um, it, if, if I do sermons, I actually don't like to give any handouts um, because I want it to be a total surprise what I'm saying. If you already know, I ruined the surprise. But this is a little bit different. We're, we're uh, you know, we're going to kind of study here. So we're going to learn as we go through. And, and this is going to be a slow go through. So a little bit at a time. We may actually not, yeah, there it is. In the footsteps of Jesus, a walk through the gospel of Luke. Make sure I can pull up my tablet notes here. Okay, close enough. My tablet likes to switch from, uh, switch versions of the uh, file that I sent. Okay. So you could, Renee, if you wanted to, you could put up the first verses, but it'll take us a while to get to those, um, get to those, those verses. So book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, um, obviously one of the, one of the four gospels. So we're going to look at first who is the author? Who, who wrote the book of Luke? Well, Luke wrote the book of Luke. That's why it's named Luke. The end. Just because a book is named after somebody isn't proof that that's, what, that's who wrote the book. So we do, we do look at this. We do look at the, at the evidence. And the evidence does point to Luke as the, as the author of the Gospel of Luke. Now, what are some things about Luke? Who was Luke? Well, Luke, we know from scripture, Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. That would have been an interesting occupation in uh, AD zero, to be a doctor, working on people and doing surgeries. I, I mean, we don't know what kind of physician he was, but we do know that, that he was a physician and as, as a physician, Luke would have had a special interest in the healing ministry of Jesus. And so he, he documents those and think of that from a, from a doctor's perspective, watching Jesus do these miraculous healings um, or, or uh, understanding the, you know, from, from the perspective that he got the information from, from eyewitnesses you know, putting somebody's ear back on, uh, healing people that were blind and, and lame. Um, he, Jesus did real stuff, real physical healings. And, and Luke documented this. Here's an interesting tidbit about Luke. He is the only non-Jewish writer of the New Testament. He was, most likely he was Greek. And how do we know that? Because if we look at uh, Colossians 4, Colossians 4, uh, in, in Colossians 4, Paul distinguishes Luke. He says, Luke, the beloved physician, 
and others from the men of the circumcision. Does anybody have that, have that pulled up? Ethan, you got that? Colossians 4. Yep. So we're looking at that to, to just give you kind of uh, some, some evidence that, that Luke was, he was, not a, a, he was not born Jewish. He was not a Jewish, uh, Jewish man. Colossians 4. There's a, there's a verse in there that, that, uh, where Paul distinguishes Luke, the beloved physician, and others from the men of the circumcision. So when the scripture says men of the circumcision, those are the Jews. Luke also wrote the book of Acts. So he wrote the gospel according to Luke. And then the next book that he wrote that follows right after that ends is the book of Acts. Now, Luke, boast, uh, he addressed both books to a man named Theophilus. You got that? You find it? Check. Oh, I thought I had this on. Check, check. Check, check. It's on. Read it. Okay, it's Colossians 4, uh, 10 and 11. It says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have uh, received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, uh, and they have been a comfort to me. Is that what you're looking for? Yes. So... There, in another passage, he talks about Luke. So in other words, the point is, is that... Oh, yeah. And then Luke, it says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Uh, give my greetings to my brothers, Laodicea and Nympha and the brothers in her house. Is that what you're talking about? That's what I'm talking about. So in that, in that section, you can see that, that Paul distinguishes Luke from the men of the circumcision. So those were the Jews. So it's, it's interesting because Paul is writing or Luke is writing the gospel from from a viewpoint that is as a non-Jewish person so he's he's writing it from that viewpoint so that that's interesting and it's and it's interesting to me as a non-Jewish person to see the perspective that you know that this gospel is written from all of the each of the gospels has a different perspective and you probably know that they have a different perspective and sort of a different audience that they were written for. Okay, so Paul, so he addressed both, both books to a man named Theophilus. There it is. You can see that in, uh, that it's written to most excellent Theophilus. Luke was a close friend of Paul. Paul calls him a fellow laborer in Philemon, Philemon. 124 verse Philemon verse 124 Paul calls Luke a fellow laborer Luke joined Paul on some of his missionary journeys and he was also with Paul when he went to Jerusalem and he was imprisoned there so Luke actually traveled quite a bit with with Paul um, Luke appears to have been very well-educated and well-traveled. He had an excellent grasp of Greek language and he was familiar with sailing and geography. And at that time, probably if you were familiar with sailing, that probably meant that you either had a job working on a ship, hauling cargo, or you were well-to-do enough that you were able to, to travel a bit. You know, it's interesting to look at these things from the different, from, you know, like the cultural context. Um, like, for example, here, where we live is a little bit different than in other places. Like uh, the guy that I work with, a business partner, he likes to call me in the afternoon and he's riding his bicycle. He lives in Portland. He rides it for exercise, if you could believe that. Okay, we only ride bikes when we don't have a driver's licenses anymore in Douglas County. That's a joke. I know some people ride them for fun. Get one of those little mini bikes. 
Different cultures are diff you know, ha have different things that makes them unique. Luke was very observant, and he wrote his account on the basis of eyewitness testimony, and we can, we can see that here, and we'll, we'll read more about that as we, as we get into the, uh, the actual the intro. Now, Luke did not meet Jesus personally, as far as we know, but he believed in him and his resurrection, so he was a believer. Luke was a saved brother. So what are the themes of the book? Well, these are, you could probably go beyond these, but these are four themes that, I, that I've written down. Uh, number one, Jesus, Jesus' ministry to outcasts, those outside the margins of, of society. Luke gives a high profile to women in the Gospel of Luke. Another theme is that God's grace is available to non-Jews, to Gentiles, through Jesus. And then another theme of Luke is Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem. So those are four themes. The third one? The third one was that God's grace is available to non-Jews, AKA Gentiles. Are there any Jews in this room, Jewish people? I think we're all Gentiles. Okay, so now let's look at the historical context and the politics of the region. You st of the region. You staying with me, Jolene? You staying awake? Okay. <laughs> all right, historical context. This is going to take a while. We're going to go all the way back to Genesis. No, this is going to be a fast survey of the Bible. Don't worry. In the beginning, God created man and put him in the Garden of Eden. And sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. Then God promised. Now, you don't have to write all these down because there's going to be a bunch of them. If you need these, I'll give you my full notes later. God promised that he would send a redeemer through the seed of Adam and Eve, and that's Genesis 3. God called Abram out of Ur, so we're, we're just do, taking a quick sequence through scripture here, of the Chaldeans, which was a city in Mesopotamia, and that is in Genesis 12. Then God made a covenant with Abram and established a people, the people of Israel, through his lineage. After a time of captivity, Moses led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt to the promised land. Then when they got to the promised land, they were governed by a series of prophets, then judges, then kings. King Saul was the first king, then King David, then King Solomon. Then the kingdom was split into two and ruled by different, a series of different kings. It was divided into Judah and Israel. The people of the land kept turning away from God, turning to idolatry. Prophets would call them back. Things would happen. God would keep pleading with them. Be my people, come back. They'd come back. Then they would go back to idolatry. This went on for many, for many uh, hundreds of years. And eventually the people were from both kingdoms were taken into captivity by uh, conquering nations. You following me so far? The sequence here. After some period of time, they were allowed to return to the land of Israel again. Now, the time between the last writer of the Old Testament, who's Malachi, and the birth of Jesus is called what? There's a period of time that's about 400 years between the the last, the writing of the last book of the Old Testament, which is called Malachi. The Great Silence. Yep. Also called um, the 400 Silent Years. Also called the Intertestamental Period. Intertestamental Period. Intertestamental Period. So it is between the Old Testament and the birth of Christ. 
400 years of silence, meaning there was no, you know, uh, books written in this period of time. Now, were there prophets operating during this time? Probably, probably, but there's no prophet that was, you know, significant enough that, that a book was written during that time. So it was called the silent years. Malachi, if, if you haven't read Malachi, it's not a very big book. I'd recommend it. Um, it is really forward looking, very prophetic. And it's talking about, I mean, it spans, you know, thousands of years of, of prophecy. Um, but it's, it, it's a great book. And so here you have the people after all of what they've gone through, they, now they've gone through this intertestimal, intertest, I can't even say it. The 400, what'd you call it? The great silence, that's easier. They, they've gone through the great silence. During this period, the great silence, Israel is, is conquered and controlled by multiple kingdoms. So first by the Persians. The Persians allowed the Jews the Jewish people backed into their country and allowed to them to practice their religion and rebuild the temple. Then Alexander the Great, have you heard of him? There's a couple of movies about him. You've heard of Alexander the Great. Greek conquered the known world at the time. I guess the known world is based on, is based on your perspective of where you live, right? Because there were other parts of the world that he didn't go to. but what we would call the Western, the Western world. Alexander the Great defeated Darius. And now there's a point that I'm telling you all of these boring things. Stay with me, Jolene. There's a point. Alexander the Greek defeated Darius of Persia and he brought Greek rule to the world. Okay, so I'm doing quotes because it's, when it's the world according to like, if you look at the Bible maps, and it's like a big circle, the Mediterranean Sea's in there, and it's the nations around that. And it go, going on up into Europe, um, and then, you know, Turkey, and, and then around in Egypt. Alexander the Greek conquered that. He, he put that whole entire region under Greek rule. Then he required Greek culture to be promoted all over every land that the Greeks conquered, they then had to speak Greek, you know, get up some Greek statues and act Greek. Greek language became prevalent because of this it was forced on the people. So all across this vast area that had spoken many languages, they still did, but now there was a common language, Greek, the language of Greek, Greek. Uh, yeah. Common Greek. After Alexander died, Judea was ruled by a series of successors. So you with me? Greek, Greece has conquered the known world. There is now a common language that's prevalent throughout this known, this, this, this world. Um, now, Alexander dies and then he, he was such a powerful man, such a powerful ruler. And when a powerful ruler like that goes away, there's a power vacuum and there's battles and there's positioning. And so that was happening in, in uh, Judea. Uh, it was ruled by a series of successors end with, ending with Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Pif Epiphanes overthrew the line of the priesthood and desecrated the temple that the Jewish, that the Jews were using I mean, the temple was sacred to, to, to the Jews. There was one temple. There's other, there became other synagogues, but there was one temple. And this uh, Epiphanes desecrated the temple with unclean animals and a pagan idol. This resulted in the Jewish revolt, which you've probably heard of the Maccabees. Okay? So... A Jewish revolt was led by the Maccabees. And then after this revolt, the people restored the temple. Then in 63 BC, which is before Christ. So, you know, approximately 60, 70 years before Christ was, was born. Pompey of Rome conquered Israel. 
Now he came in and conquered the land. And, and he put all of Judea under the control of the Caesars. Now we're starting to talk about Rome. So we had Greek culture. Now we've got Roman culture coming in and taking over. This led to Herod, who you've probably heard of, being crowned king in Judea. There was a series of Herods, and we'll get to that. So, there is your, there's your squashed together history to take us to this point. Why is that important? Well, it's important to understand that for all of those many years, there, there is... There is an event that's being waited for, and that is the birth of, of the Messiah. That is what the people have been waiting for, and that's a promise from the very beginning. It's important to understand the history of what's happened and the culture of what's happened, because what Jesus came into was a land that, even though they were under domination by Rome, they had a, a, a system whereby travel was possible, uh, commerce was possible, and a common language was there so that it set it up for the eventual spread of Christianity as it happened in the book of Acts. Okay, so let's take a look at the religion uh, of, of during this time. So during this intertestamental time, I can't even say the word, say it again. The great silence. <laughs> I should have just wrote that. During this time, religion, the Jewish religion, changed a little bit. So up rose the Pharisees. We've all heard of the Pharisees. I knew in, in uh, Bible school that they were bad. And the Sadducees were because they were sad, you see. So who are these people? The Pharisees, they were a sect of Jews, a, a, a group of Jews, and they rose up during this time. They added to the law of, of Moses. So the, the books of Moses, that what we call the law, the Pharisees added to that through what they call oral tradition. So they would get together and they would say, yep, those are the laws, and then here's some more. And they would come up with some more and then they would pass those down. So that's the oral tradition. And they considered these more important than God's law. Some of those are like uh, Jesus. Remember how often uh, the people, the, the leaders would get after Jesus for like healing on the Sabbath. Um, you were not, you were only allowed to walk a certain distance on the Sabbath. It was prescribed. Like, I don't know how many steps it was, but there was a certain distance you could go. You couldn't carry like you know, a handkerchief or something like that was that was considered work. So they these guys took everything to the extreme level. So that's what Jesus was speaking into when he came in. And somebody says, you you can't heal on the Sabbath. That's that's working. And he would have to he would have to refute them. Uh, why, that is why he said things like, well, you know, uh, if your if your donkey fell in a hole on the Sabbath, you're just going to let him die. Or are you going to pull them out? Because pulling them out is technically work. That's how messed up it was by the time that Jesus came, came into the picture here. So that's the Pharisees. And as you see, Jesus references them over and over. They were very prominent in, in society. And they were very respected by, this, by this society at that time. They were the cool guys. The Sadducees, the other group, were aristocrats and they were wealthy. And they rejected all scripture except for the Mosaic books of the Old Testament and they did not believe in resurrection. So you have these two groups. The Sadducees controlled uh, the, the temples. The Pharisees uh, worked out of uh, the synagogues. And they were kind of the day-to-day, -day, you know, I don't know if you'd call them preachers, but they were the people that, it, there's one other group, that's the scribes. Um, I didn't, I didn't uh, include them in this, but, so there you got Pharisees, Sadducees. So just to summarize that, 
We've had 400 silent years with no prophetic books. You've got Pharisees and Sadducees. You have a large area of the world. It's been conquered first by the Greeks and then by the Romans. And there's one common language spoken and written throughout this world. Okay, now we can actually introduce our, our scripture. And I pulled this out of, out of New King James. Um, I did look at, you know, it's, it's awesome to look at different versions too, but um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna just look at the first um, few verses here of, of Luke. So, inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So Luke is writing to someone named Theophilus. And I tried, but I couldn't figure out who Theophilus was. <laughs> Nobody knows. He's a mystery man. The book of Acts is also addressed to Theophilus. Where's my next Bible, Bible reader? Acts 1, verses 1 to 3. Who's got that? Raise your hand. Oh, Megan, your husband just volunteered you to write, to read Acts 1, 1 through 3. We're waiting. Acts what? 1, 1, verses 1 to 3. Chapter 1. Verses 1 to 3. The microphone ready. We're, we're live streaming. I would prefer if you'd look in the, in the camera too. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. That'll work. Okay, so the point of that was to show you that, that Luke wrote the book of Acts to the same guy, to Theophilus. That's a long letter. Two long letters. All written by hand, too. There's no email back in that day can you imagine no texting <laughs> that would be nice actually yeah you'd be like can you get a hold of uh, theophilus I'm like no theophilus went for a hike in the desert he won't be back for 20 days you can't you can't call him just have to wait till he gets back luke acknowledges that others have also written about the works of Jesus. So he says, inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative. So he's basically saying there's other accounts at the time that, that this was written. Um, I believe that this was, I, I might've missed that part, but I think that this was written in about, uh, 65 AD that, that the gospel of Luke was written. So about 65 years after the birth of, of Christ. No, no, that's first Peter. Never mind. I don't know when this book was written. I'm going to give you wrong information. Get fact checked. That's the book of Peter. Okay. So Luke is writing this after he's collected information and, and he's interviewed eyewitnesses. But at the time, there were many people who wrote about the things that Jesus did. It wasn't just Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Now, um, over time, some, there's been some accounts that were, they figured out, well, these are not 
actually from, you know, historically accurate. They're not even from the right time. And Jesus is doing weird things that don't make sense. Um, those, those books were uh, apocryphal. Um, there were books that were not included in the in what's called the canon of scripture because they they figured out okay these are not these are not correct uh, but there were other accounts that were written about Jesus these uh, these four books Luke Matthew Mark Luke and John were were the four that ended up being uh, preserved and and are, are part of scripture now Luke has researched written accounts as well as interviewed eyewitnesses accounts, eyewitnesses account, most likely including the account written by Mark. You'll see similarities between uh, Mark and Luke, um, and, and Luke may have used some of, of Mark's material in, in his gospel. But he is, he's researched this and in order, and also talking with eyewitnesses who were with Jesus, who interacted with Jesus. Luke is writing an orderly account, is what, is what he says here. Um, where does he say that? Uh, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. Uh, some versions will say a chronological account, but that's not really, it's not really a chronological account. By orderly, um, I was looking at the at the the Greek on that too, but it really just means that it's it's a it, he wants to do it in an orderly way, organized, organized way. So it not necessarily follows in a in a, a chronological order. He says, having perfect understand, having had perfect understanding having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. Um, I was looking at what, what does that mean? Uh, because to, to me, that means you, you're, you understand everything perfectly, but that's not really the, the proper, uh, it, means that he, it means that he carefully investigated everything. He understood it, he's got an accurate account. That's really what it means. After all, Luke was with Paul for like two years. And he would have, on, on his travels with Paul, he would have met um, other uh, people that had been, that had walked with Jesus. He traveled with Paul all over the place. And he would have been able to interview uh, other apostles and other eyewitnesses to Jesus' ministry. Luke um, also mentions uh, Joanna later in, in the book of Luke, in, in uh, Luke 8 uh, and, and, in, and, in, and in chapter 24. Joanna was the wife of Herod's steward. So we'll, we'll learn more about Herod. But so Herod, evil mean guy, his steward basically his butler or whatever you want to call it, his servant, his wife. Now I'm telling you like a, like a story like you tell me, like, no, that's so-and-so's brother, sister's aunt. I'm like, what? Whew. Joanna Stewart. Joanna is the steward's wife. She understood the inner workings of the palace, basically. And so, and Luke was able to interview her. And so that he had some inside information um, about Herod. Then it says that you may know with certainty of these things in which you were instructed. In other words, these things are true. These things I'm writing you, these things are true. Okay. The book of Gospel Luke, Gospel of Luke is organized there's different ways to look at this. If you look at different sources, you'll find different different uh, sections and different ways of organizing this. Um, the Gospel of Luke is organized as follows. So chapters one through two is the Old Testament promises of a Messiah. Chapters three to somewhere in, in chapter four, Jesus is the Messiah. Chapters four through uh, towards the end of chapter nine, 
Jesus' power and teaching, his claims of authority. And then chapters 9, uh, the end of 9 through 19, verse 44, it, it, that focuses on the rift between Jesus and the leaders. And then uh, chapters 19, uh, the end of 19 through uh, 24, that covers the final controversies, uh, trial, death, resurrection, and ascension of, of Jesus. Now, are you with me so far? I'm going to um, introduce our first character here. And this is Herod. What I like to do as I'm reading through, reading through Luke is that as I come to a, come to a character, I write, that, I write that person's name down and kind of get to know him. Like, okay, here's a new person in the story. So as we move into, uh, further into uh, chapter Luke, the first thing I wanted to look at before we read further is Herod. Herod the Great. Does anybody have any in, inside information into, into, into Herod? Herod the Great. You got, if you guys want to chip in, that's why I got this microphone for. You got something to say, I'll bring you the microphone. No? All right. I'll tell you about Herod. Herod. What's that? Yes. Herod was Jewish. Okay. Now, there's other sources for the things that happen in, in the New Testament. So, when, when uh, people like to tell you that there's, you know, I don't know why you believe in that Jesus guy. He didn't even exist. Wrong. And that's what you tell them. Wrong. As soon as they say it, say wrong. He does. There's too much evidence. In fact, so when I was young, I know that people would be, more people would be able to say, ah, oh, there's no evidence for, for Jesus. But now we can say immediately, wrong. There is. They don't even try to say there wasn't on the History Channel when they're telling tell you about Jesus. You ever notice on the History Channel and what's the other one? There's a military channel. And they, for some reason, they're like, hey, let's do a, let's do a series on Christian stuff. And then they bring in the people that hate Christianity, the same ones every time, that say, ah, oh, Christians don't know what they're talking about. Uh, you know, Mary Magdalene was, you know, gave birth to Jesus' son, and I moved over here, and it says it in this book. And it's nuts, okay? Don't get your Christianity from the History Channel. Don't. It'll be wrong, wrong, wrong. Now, there are other historians that you can look at. Josephus is an interesting one. Uh, Josephus was a, was a Jewish historian, um, and he wrote about many things. He wrote uh, histories, history of the Jews. He also wrote about Jesus. Uh, so he, he, didn't, he didn't say a whole lot about him, but he said, yeah, there's, there's this Jesus guy, and he, you know, he started this, you know, this religion started after, after his death, and I, I believe he may refer to the resurrection, but I could be wrong about that. But Josephus refers to him, and Josephus is actually... Um, also a source here uh, for who Herod is. So there's Herod the Great. There was a historical figure also known as Herod the First. And he was a king of Judea as a client of Rome. So Rome said, this is our country. We'll let you be the king. But you got to do what we say. And he said, Okay, I'll, I'll be the king and do what you say. He rebuilt the temple of Jerusalem. His father, Antipater, made him the governor of Galilee. But there was fighting, and Herod's brother was taken captive and he committed suicide. So Herod fled to Rome and he gained uh, favor 
with some of the Roman leaders with Octavia and Mark Antony. You've probably heard those names. So he, he got in tight with these guys. Then he came back to Jerusalem uh, with a Roman general, Gaius, and he retook the city. So he reconquered the city, and then he ruled it for 33 years. Now, uh, Eleanor, you were asking, was he Jewish? He was actually an Edomite. Does anybody know what an Edomite is? You know what Edomite is? Descendant of Esau. So the Jews of Jerusalem did not like him because he was a descendant of Esau. Now, this is what I'm talking about is Herod the Great. His son, as actually the Herod that killed John the Baptist and met Jesus. So there was a, a few Herods. So it'd be like the name that you'd pass down. Yes. It's a good question. I think it's a, they were related. So the Herods were, were related, like Herod the Great was the first one. And then the other guys, they would, they would take his name, probably like the royal family does maybe. Like when they take, you know, Charles and then Charles and Charles and Charles the 10th and Charles the 12th. <laughs> they just keep on going. Not a healthy system. Yeah, no, I think Harold is, is more of a surname. I think, it, I think it is, but it's something worth looking at. Okay, so that's our next character. Now, the reason that I told you about our next character, and it's not in your notes, is because we ran through the first set of notes that I put together. So now we're going off of scribble notes from a year ago, which have not been transposed into a typewritten format. And we've got a few minutes left here, so that's what we're doing right now, is we're taking these last few minutes to to uh, kind of set up the next, the next introduction. And so we're, we're getting to know a, a couple more people. So now we know Harold, Herod, uh, sorry, we already know you, Harold. <laughs> we're getting to know Herod, okay. Um, and, and again, if you have, have any questions or input, now's a, a good time for that. Fire away. Okay. So let's look now at, at Zacharias. This will be a little more choppy, and you'll have to forgive me because these are my notes from, from three years ago. Let's look at who, who is Zacharias, because he's the next guy that we're gonna come to. So we read through verses one through four. The next, the next block basically starts here in, uh, in verse five. And the reason that I was talking about Herod is because that's how verse five starts. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. So we've got two more characters here. Zacharias, uh, can somebody look up uh, uh, another Bible verse? But it would be 1 Chronicles 24 and then verses 4 through 10. Okay, so Zacharias, his name means Jehovah has remembered. And when you get when you get First Chronicles 24, when you find that, raise your hand, I'll bring you a microphone. So Zacharias means Jehovah remembered. You got it? Chip? He... Ethan's just too zippy. You know what I mean? Like, he's still young. He's just so fast. Um, four through... Hold on. Okay. First Chronicles 24, 4 through 10. And there were... And there were more chief men found of the sons of Eleazar than of the sons of Ithamar, and thus were they divided. Among the sons of Eleazar, there were sixteen chief men of the house of their fathers, and eight among the sons of Ithamar, 
according to the house of their fathers. Thus were they divided by lot, one sort with another, for the governors of the sanctuary and governors of the house of God were of the sons of Eleazar and of the sons of Ithamar. And Shemaiah, the son of Nethanel, the scribe, one of the Levites, wrote them before the king and the princes and Zadok, the priest, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, and before the chief of the fathers of the priests and Levites, one principal household being taken for Eleazar and one taken for Ithamar. Now the first lot came forth to Jeho Jehorib, and the second of Je Judea, the third Haram, and the fourth Seorim, and the fifth Malkijah, and the sixth Mijamin, and the seventh Hakaz, and the eighth Abijah, and the ninth Jeshua, and the tenth Shechaniah. I think we could stop torturing you now. You got to the Abijah. <laughs> Sorry about that, Chip. <laughs> that was good. Give, give Chip a hand. Come on now. I didn't realize the torture I was putting you through. I haven't looked at that for a while. I just had it written down here. Then I realized you were doing the, all of those names. You did a good job. You only had one of them pronounced wrong. No, I don't know which one it was. <laughs> yeah. So... That is to say that, that Zacharias was from, he was from a division of Abijah, and we heard where that came from. That was set up by, uh, under David's rule. So long, long lineage. That's the lineage of, of the priest Zacharias. Now we meet his daughter, Elizabeth, his wife, one of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. So Elizabeth is one of the daughters of Aaron. So she was also from the priestly tribe. That's who these two people are. Priests from a priestly line. And it says that they were righteous before God. How did you get to be righteous at this time, at this time in, in biblical history? How would you be righteous before God? Any thoughts? Following the law? You, that would be pretty tough to be considered righteous before God, before Christ died. Would it, uh, my question is like, would it be still in a sense by faith as in like Abraham was justified by faith, Noah was justified by faith. They didn't David, have a law though, right? Well, I mean, David was, David had the law. I mean, I was, I was just yeah. quoting Hebrews 11. Right. So they were all justified by faith or trust in God. Yeah, and no, so I think was, that's part that, of it. Was that, and that was counted as, as righteousness. So would we say that they also had faith that counted them as righteousness as well as maybe following the law? Is that plausible? I don't know. <laughs> it's okay to say I, I don't know. Uh, no, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, because, yeah, it may, not, not necessarily that they, that they followed the, letter, the law to the letter of the law, but, but that they walked righteously before God. <laughs> And I'm sure that that's part of it at that at that time that you that you that you followed that. But that's a great point that the, the scripture does tell us that they were that certain people that were justified by faith. So I think that is to, to tell us that generally these were people that God considered to be righteous people. Marv. I guess if you keep going, you know, they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. There you go. There's how you fulfill it, I would yeah. say. Yeah. So that's who Zacharias and Elizabeth are. Now, verse 7 tells us that they were 
barren and, sorry, elderly. How many of you get, get, get the AA? Some of you probably are members of AARP, right? Or no, it's an evil organization. I don't know. I know I've been getting their uh, solicitations for quite some time. It's not appreciated. I'll call them and tell them. Don't send that to me anymore. Huh? Yes, yes. I, and I say, no, thank you. Into the fireplace you go. Uh, years ago, I'm, at least 10 years ago, I was camping in, in Washington at a state, a Washington state campground. And the, uh, I had a camp trailer there and the, uh, the park host came up to me and, and said, asked if I paid yet. And I said, I was getting ready to, and she said, do you want the senior discount? And I said, absolutely not. No, because I don't think I was, I don't know how old, how old was I? Yeah, I was only 40, come on. That's offensive. Uh, if I took it, I would not be described as righteous. Uh, right. I'd be a liar. <laughs> exactly. It's not worth saving five bucks or whatever it would have been. Even though I wanted to. But I was offended. Come on. Okay, so no offense. No offense. But uh, Elizabeth was barren and elderly. How many times do we see this in scripture of someone who is a woman and, and often the man too, that they're, they're up in age, that they're, the, the scripture says that they're, you know, they're old, no offense, they're barren. Um, why? It's, it's just interesting to me. What is the symbolism of this? Does anybody have any thoughts? Marv. <laughs> well, I don't want the people online to miss out. Um, well, nobody's going to get the glory except God in this situation. Oh, I mean, there, there's uh, just yeah. no way, advanced in years and barren, considered yeah. barren, that anybody else would get the glory. Yes, that's good. That's good. Let's clap for Marv. That was really good. No, I really like that because, uh, because that's really true. It, God gets the glory when, when the situation is impossible and you can't do it. If God was to say, hey, uh, you know, 35 year old healthy man and woman, I'm gonna give you a baby. They would say, uh, okay, that's, you know, or you're going to have a child. And they would say, okay, okay that's, of, of course, we probably will. But, you know, when they're old and that's not an option anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, you got to think about that. That's pretty interesting to me. I like that. I, it makes me, uh, when I uh, consider the, the story of Samson, Samson's problem was that God gave him great strength. So he really got to the, to the place where he just, he's like, I can, I, it's me doing this. It's me. He didn't have magic hair, by the way. <laughs> God just lifted his hand off of him when he broke his final vow. Okay, back to our, back to our talk. Okay. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. Oh, I, I see my thought. My thought was that it was something that I can't read because I can't read my own writing. Okay. So now I'm going to read, I'm going to read on uh, verses eight and nine. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division. Now remember who Zacharias is and that he is from a special lineage of, of priests. So while he is serving as a priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of priesthood, 
his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord and the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. So what I read about this was that, do you know how many times the lot would fall to you to go in if you were serving as a priest and the lot would fall to you to go in and burn incense in this temple? Do you know how many times that would happen in your lifetime? Maybe once. That's it. This was not just something that all the priests did. This was a big deal. Yes. What? Did they go into the did they go into the Holy of Holies to burn the incense or where did they go in the temple to do that? Well, let's see if we can figure it out. Does anybody know? Does anybody have some thoughts? Want to take a guess? Yeah, I don't know that at this time that was so so here's what here's what I I do have some study notes here that, that they, this is what they says it was a high honor because the large number of priests most would never be chosen for such a duty and no one was permitted to serve in this capacity twice. Zacharias no doubt regarded this as the supreme moment in a lifetime of priestly service. The incept was kept burning perpetually just in front of the veil that divided the holy place from the most holy place. The lone priest would offer the incense every morning and every evening while the rest of the priests and worshipers stood outside the holy place in prayer. So this was not into the Holy of Holies. This was uh, a regular incense um, tending that he did. I think that that might be a good time to 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 end this and then we'll we'll pick up again um, starting at verse 11 so we've met uh, we've met Herod the first Herod in in scripture um, we've met Zacharias Elizabeth we're going to learn more about them as we as we continue when we continue um, we're going to look at the, the announcement of the birth of, of John uh, before we ever get to Jesus. It's going to be a little bit. So we're going to meet a few more of these characters. Um, who else? That's it. And then and we, we, we talked about Luke. Anybody else have any, any thoughts or insight or questions that we can, we can answer in our our next session. Here comes the microphone. I have a little thought on on the word. When we read the word, we we're reading words, and there's meaning to those words that we can receive. But there's also times that the Holy Spirit kind of shares some things that are kind of like I I would describe as as kind of re reading between the lines and this this opening phrase here it's uh, starting in verse 3 it says it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write to you an orderly account most excellent Theophilus one of the things that that when we read the scriptures, I think many of us have gone back through scripture that we have read before and we have received something different. Uh, I think we've all probably have experienced that. The more you read the Bible, uh, there's things, oh, hey, you know what, I didn't pick that out. Uh, I didn't see, see that uh, the last time. But there's things that the Holy Spirit will kind of highlight and, and for me personally, one thing that, that was kind of cool was that portion that says, to write to you an orderly account, 
most excellent Theophilus. Now, if we, if we, if we are technical about it, this was not written to us. This was written to Theophilus. Right. If we take it at, at face value, but since the since the word is written in in the spirit, it's interesting that we really don't know we don't know much about this person Theophilus. But what the Holy Spirit just kind of laid on my heart, reading through this passage of scripture, Theophilus means friend of God. So Theos means God, and right. in the Greek, Philos means friend. Yeah. And what, what the Holy Spirit just laid on my heart when I had read through through this, it, it's, it's mentioning here, most excellent Theophilus, most excellent friend of God. Mm. So when we read it, it's the Holy Spirit giving this instruction to us that it's the Holy Spirit saying, you, we are friends of God, most excellent. God sees us as excellent. God sees us not, not as, as what we are, but, but he's, he's already calling as though we are already excellent, which, which we are because of the blood of Jesus. But when I read this, I don't read it like, okay, this is historical. This is something that uh, Paul, or uh, uh, that Luke is writing to Theophilus. But when I read it before, that just kind of caught my attention there. Most excellent Theophilus, most excellent friend of God. Hey, wait a second. I'm a friend of God, and yeah. we can all read it in that way that this is being written to you as well, not yeah. just to Theophilus. Yeah. So just a thought. Yeah, that's awesome. Anybody else have any thoughts? Agreed? Any other input? Yes. I was just checking this out through the BSB, which is an English translation, and it it opens up in verse opens up verse two even more, where it says, well, in verse one about making many have undertaken to compose an account of things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by the initial witnesses and servants of the of the word. Mm. So he's he's reassuring Theophilus that. What he knows, what he has learned, what he has heard is true. And so he puts it down in, in the orderly account as these witnesses have said these things or what they've witnessed, what they've learned from the, from the Holy Spirit through the word. And then he's, he's using those now to secure his confidence in what he has learned. That's good. Anybody else? Well, no, this was, yeah, go ahead. You only get seven chances to speak on a Wednesday, though. That's a 6.5. Well, it's just a, a thought that actually crossed my mind, because normally uh, we think of the apostles as the one having the authority to write scripture. Uh, and Luke, being a Gentile and not one of the initial 12, uh, we assume that he also wasn't an apostle. Right. Um, but somehow, I wonder if uh, him writing this, he was getting you know eyewitness testimony from the apostles, just as uh, Mark. I don't think he was an, an actual apostle, but he was copying down. We assume Peter's testimony of of uh, what occurred. But I'm wondering if him having a perfect understanding of all things was just kind of him admitting, or, or maybe it's the Holy Spirit working through him, saying like, I, like. Maybe it's attesting to the authority of these writing. Mm -hmm. I wonder if yeah. that's just a thought I had. I have no idea to back, no reason to back that up. It's just yeah. an idea. No. Well, I think that's, I think that's a, a, a pretty good understanding of that perfect. What does KGV say on that? Uh, 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 verse three. It seemed good to me also having had a, perfect is one translation of the Greek, but 
but it need it, it's like Eleanor said it's like I, I got it I understand this I'm telling you this this truthfully I have a total comprehension of this I have no doubts of what I'm telling you perfect understanding okay yeah so I know that this was a, it was a little bit different and uh, you can be honest in your feedback. <laughs> um, I, I uh, you know, I do. Ha I have this this handwritten notebook from from three years ago during COVID. Uh, I went down to the park and was uh, started this Bible study. So Pat was down there. Uh, that's where I met Peggy. Um, had had a few others, and we were just hanging out in the park for a little bit weekly. And I just loved it so much because um, in the preparation for um, for doing this, I learned more than I ever had before about about scripture, or, or about um, about the uh, this gospel, and um, I just think that by by taking the time to you know look at the words, uh, look at the meanings, look at the people, get the context about who they are, that it is just when we get to Jesus uh, and we start reading about Him and seeing what He does, I just feel like that. We, we will gain a, a greater understanding of, of who Jesus was and is, and is forever. So, um, so thank you. Uh, if you want the expanded notes, you can tell me, I'll give you the expanded notes. Um, and next week, I won't have a, a phone call to Australia at 4 p.m. before I do the the thing so I'll be a less wiped out even though Australians speak English they speak it weird and they're I can't figure out what time it is there are one day ahead it's Thursday over there it's just not right they're upside down you know what I mean they're on the bottom yeah it's just wrong it's just wrong <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll pray and, and, and we'll release, um, and then I'll see you guys Friday night for worship, worship and prayer night. It's going to be awesome and amazing. And Ethan's going to find out what's going to happen. <laughs> All right. Heavenly father, God, we just thank you for this time, Lord. God, I love you and I love these people. God, thank you for this church family, Lord. God, help us to grow uh, in these times together, God. Knit us together, God. Knit us together uh, to, be, to be the church that you've called us to be, Father. Thank you for the way that, you are, that you're moving and, and that you're, you're teaching us, Lord, and you're leading us. We lift all these, to, the, these things to you, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.